We're continuing our series of readings through the book of Proverbs. Tonight we're in Proverbs 27. And so if you have a copy of God's word with you or a copy of the scriptures at hand, please open that up at Proverbs 27. And we're reading from verse 1 down to verse 14 this evening. Proverbs 27, starting at verse 1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. A stone is heavy, and sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than both of them. Wrath is cruel, and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. A dissatisfied soul loathes a honeycomb, but to a hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Like a bird that wanders from its nest is a man who wanders from his place. Ointment and perfume delight the heart, and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend, nor go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. My son, be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him who reproaches me. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself the simple pass on and are punished. Take the garment of him who is surety for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he is surety for a seductress. He who blesses his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning, it will be counted a curse to him. And we ask God to bless the public reading of his word once more. I'm going to take a moment and just commit our evening to the Lord in prayer. So if we just still our hearts for a moment, Bow our heads and close our eyes, we'll speak to God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this opportunity once more to come and open this building to your glory and meet and enjoy worship and fellowship together in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for today. We thank you for time spent in this building already under the instruction of your word, time singing praises together and enjoying fellowship with one another. Father, that time of communion and reflection around the table of remembrance. Father, we want to thank you for your greatness and for your faithfulness in each of our lives and for your goodness to us day by day. You alone are worthy of all the honor and all the praise. We thank you for your great salvation. We thank you for your own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that came to earth, humbled himself to live as a man, and to take the punishment that we all deserved as he was hung on the cross at Calvary. Father, we just thank you for what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. Help us to communicate the good news of the gospel to others around us in the week that lies ahead. Father, we thank you for Lewis with us today. We thank you for his testimony. We thank you for your leading in his life. We thank you for his ministry this morning, which was refreshing to each one of us. We ask for your help for him tonight. May he know your strength and your help as he again opens your word and shares what you've laid on his heart. Bless him and Sharon in the days that lie ahead, uh, in the work now that you've been involved in at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Lisburn. Pray your blessing upon them. May they know your leading and guiding. And Father, we want to ask that you bless all who are helping tonight in any small way. We thank you for every one of their efforts. And Father, we just pray that personally they will be blessed and collectively we will enjoy the blessing together. Father, we pray for Wednesday evening as, as, as Lewis makes preparation for that too. And again, as he spends time in the quiet place, we pray that he knows your help. 
We want to give thanks to you, Father, for the outreach that has been happening over the weekend through the children's and youth ministries, for Pathfinders and Youth Club, for Children's Church, and the opportunity and responsibility of sharing the gospel with these age groups. We thank you for it. We thank you for the teams that are involved. And most of all, we pray, Father, that the children will be attentive to the word of God and that they will apply it to their lives. Father, we want to remember those who will be serving you in various capacities this evening from this fellowship, for those who will opportunity in the week that lies ahead, and for our church mission family, pray your blessing upon all their efforts also. So Father, help us tonight. Prepare the hearts of boys and girls and men and women that still have not made a decision for your kingdom. Father, may their eyes be open tonight. May their ears be attentive to your word. And may they find Jesus tonight. Father, we thank you again for all things. You are a God who is mighty to save. You are the one that can proclaim the victory right from the beginning of time. And we stand amazed in your presence tonight. Bless us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together, friends, if you stand to sing, please, on the cross, on the cross. A great place to come to and to sing about as we stand tonight and worship God together. Let us sing the words that are on the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny. Good evening, everyone. 
Thanks for having me this evening again in car. If you open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I said this morning that um, this morning and this evening we're going to be looking at two of Jesus' Beatitudes. And this evening we're going to be looking at the second Beatitude. But before we do so, let's pray to God and ask for his help to understand this passage. Let's pray. Father, we realize that the natural man natural man in a sinful state cannot understand your word, your, your words of life. So we ask that the Spirit will come and give us ears to hear and hearts to understand your word. We pray, Lord, that as we study this second beatitude, that our study, our meditation will be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew 5, and we'll read from verses 1 down to verse 4 together. Matthew 5, verse 1, God's word says this. Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And this is God's word to us this evening. The story is told of a crafty criminal who broke in to a department store during the night. And when he broke into the department store, what he done was he went around all the jewelry and he switched the price tags on the jewelry. The next, he, he, didn't, he didn't ransack the place, brother. He left after switching the price tags. He left and went home. The next day he came into the department store. He was welcomed at the front by the staff members. He was shown around the jewelry and he started to lift different bits of jewelry. He went to the checkout and got a diamond ring for a pittance. He got a thousand dollar necklace for virtually nothing. His daylight robbery was the result of switching the price tags. He switched those that were on the pricey stuff to those that were on the cheap stuff. And he, he, he committed this great daylight robbery. And we could say that in our sinful fallen world, the price tags have been switched. That which is truly valuable is regarded as cheap. And that which is re, uh, regarded as worthless is held in high esteem. And yet here in the Beatitudes, Jesus puts the right price tags back in place. He tells us in these Beatitudes what is truly valuable in this life. He outlines for us the life that is truly fulfilling, the life that is truly blessed. And this evening he says that the mournful are blessed. Blessed are the mournful, for they shall be comforted. And as we study this passage this evening, this second Beatitude, I want us to ask two questions that will help, uh, hopefully help us understand the meaning of this second Beatitude. The first question is this, what is this morning? What is this morning? When we think of mourning, we immediately think about grieving the death of someone. And yet when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, he isn't describing those who mourn because of death. And yet I realize this evening that there are many in this congregation who are suffering bereavement. You are mourning the death of a loved one, a wife, a husband, a friend, a daughter, a son, a brother, a sister, a mother, or a father. And yet I want you to remind you that although Jesus isn't speaking about mourning the death of a loved one here in this passage his word elsewhere does address your situation. 2 Corinthians 1.3 reminds us that God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in our afflictions. Psalm 147.3 reminds us that God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I, God speaking, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. If you're suffering bereavement this morning, if you're, uh, this evening, sorry, if you're suffering the loss of a loved one, God is a rock that you can depend on. He's a refuge that you can hide in, in the midst of your turmoil. But this second beatitude, as I said, flows on from the first beatitude. Therefore, the blessed mourner here in the beatitudes is the one who mourns their spiritual poverty. 
They grieve their spiritual bankruptcy before God. If you were here this morning, we, we, we discovered this, that the first beatitude, look at it there with me in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first beatitude describes those who are spiritual beggars, those who realize that before God they are nothing, and therefore they throw all their weight and all their dependence upon God. And this flows then into the second beatitude. Those who mourn are those who grieve their natural identity. They grieve their spiritual bankruptcy before God. Now in the New Testament, in the original language, the Greek, there are nine words to describe sorrow. And the word that Jesus uses here is the strongest one. It speaks of a deep, genuine, heartfelt grief. It is the same word that is used elsewhere to speak of um, that grief, that agonizing pain uh, when you, what, that you suffer when you experience the death of a loved one. And the form this word takes is, means that Jesus is describing a continuous, ongoing ati- activity. The blessed person is not one who mourns once and then ticks it off their list. Rather, the blessed person, according to Jesus in the second beatitude, is the one who mourns and keeps on mourning. They mourn their sinfulness and they continue mourning their sinfulness. It's similar to what Martin Luther, the great reformer, said in his 95 Theses. The first thesis was that the, the Christian life is a life of continual repentance. We continually mourn and grieve over our spiritual bankruptcy, over our spiritual condition, over our sin. And according to Jesus, the blessed person, the truly happy, the one who is truly fulfilled, is the one who truly sees their sinfulness, mourns their sinfulness, and then confesses their sinfulness. They don't make excuses. They don't blame others. Rather, they acknowledge that they have sinned against God. They mourn this fact and they repent of their sin. I want us to think about that. The blessed man acknowledges that they have sinned against God. The blessed man acknowledges that they have sinned against God. Normally in kids' work, if you've ever done any kids' work, you'll know that we describe sin to kids as something we think, say, or do that breaks God's law and displeases God. Sin is anything we think, say, or do that breaks God's law and displeases God. And I like this definition of sin because this definition of sin realizes and observes that sin is first and foremost a wrongdoing against God. It's first and foremost an offense against God. It breaks his law. It displeases him. We see this in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a psalm by King David. If you're familiar with the situation of David, King David, he's hurt by Sheba because he's used her as a possession to satisfy his lust. He has wronged Uriah the Hittite the husband of Bathsheba, because he, he, he sent him in the battle and he's made sure that he's killed on the battlefield. He's also wronged the nation of Israel because he's supposed to be their king. He's supposed to be a man of integrity, and yet he's not. He's a man uh, who has wronged the nation. He's failed Bathsheba. He's wronged Uriah. He's wronged the nation. And yet in Psalm 51, verse 3 to 4, he says this, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Speaking to God, he says, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Here David isn't denying that he's wronged many parties. Rather, he's acknowledging that the main party that he has wronged in his sin is God. You see, Sin is not a mere accident. Sin is not simply just a mistake that can be swept under the carpet. Rather, sin is cosmic treason against God, the king of the heavens and earth. Sin is spitting in the face of the Almighty. Sin grieves the heart of God. In fact, our sin, the sin that you commit it, The little sins and the big sins, your sin drove the nails into Jesus Christ's hands and feet when he was on the cross. Your sin, our sin, 
made sure that the Holy One of Israel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was insulted upon the cross. Our sin crucified Jesus Christ, the author of life. You see, all the sin that we have ever committed or will commit is the reason why Jesus Christ went to the cross and died. Our sin crucified the author, author of life. And if we are to truly mourn our sinfulness, if we are to be the blessed person that Jesus describes here in Matthew 5, then we need to acknowledge the true nature of our sin. That means that your laziness in the workplace tomorrow is not simply unproductive and a bad thing for your boss. Rather, it angers God Almighty. That means your gossip here in, in the church is not simply an insult against others. Rather, it is an insult against the head of the church, Jesus Christ. That means that your abuse in the home, physically and emotionally, against your spouse or against your children. That abuse is not simply an attack upon them. Rather, it is a violent attack upon God. The adultery in your heart is not simply unfaithfulness to your spouse. Rather, it's unfaithfulness to God Almighty. The disobedience that you show to your parents doesn't just simply hurt them. It grieves God. Sin is first and foremost a crime against God. And Jesus tells us that the blessed man acknowledges this. The blessed man acknowledges that they have sinned against God. But not simply do they acknowledge that they have sinned against God, but the blessed man mourns over sin. The blessed man mourns over sin. I wonder do you remember back to uh, the scenes in Dublin in 2018 when the abortion law was passed, the legalization of the murder of babies was greeted by dancing, clapping, cheering, smiling, and laughing. Laughing. We live in a world where sin is celebrated. And yet Jesus tells, tells his followers that they must have a completely different reaction to sin Rather than celebrating sin, Jesus' followers must mourn sin. We must mourn our own sinfulness, and we must mourn the sinfulness of our world. We must mourn the sinfulness of others. We must be grieved by the fact that all sin committed grieves the heart of God Almighty. And I wonder this evening, is this your reaction to sin? How do you react to your own sin? How do you react to the sins of others and the sins in this world? Do you protect your sin? Do you cuddle it? Or do you mourn over it? Are you grieved when you realize that your sin crucified Jesus Christ? Or how do you react when you see the sins of others in this world? Do you laugh at them? Do you gossip about them? Do you judge them? Or do you as Jesus says here, do you mourn over them? Jesus calls us in this passage, if you're a Christian this evening, he calls you not to judge sin, nor to laugh at sin, nor to celebrate sin, nor to gossip about sin, nor to joke about sin, but to mourn sin. Psalm 119, verse 136. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. I wonder if you ever shed tears because of the sinfulness in our world. Well, Jesus says here, the blessed man mourns sin. The blessed man realizes the true nature of sin. The blessed man mourns sin. But then the blessed man repents of his sin. The blessed man repents of his sin. In your Bibles, please, flick over to 2 Corinthians for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to verse 10. Second Corinthians 7, verse 8 says this, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. 
As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through, it, through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Here Paul tells us that he wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, and it's probably not the, the first letter. It's probably a letter that we don't possess now. But it seems that in this letter, whatever the contents of this letter were, Jesus, uh, not, not Jesus, sorry, Paul rebuked the Corinthians. And how did they react to the, to the rebuke? Well, he tells us here, he, he says that they were grieved with a godly grief. And this godly grief then produced repentance and led to salvation. They were grieved with a godly grief. Now, the opposite of godly grief, we would assume, is no grief at all, no grief over all, at all, just celebrating and keep going on with sin. Rather, Paul tells us here that the opposite of godly grief is a worldly grief. You see, there's a wrong type of grieving over sin. It's worldly grief. It's sorrow and regret over the consequences of your sin. It's grieving your sin because it's backfired on you. It's mourning the sin, not because it's first and foremost rebellion against God, but because it's, it's came back and hit you in the face. It's made you uncomfortable and it's brought negative consequences to your life. It's a selfish grief. But godly grief, the blessed mourning that Jesus speaks about in the second beatitude produces repentance. The individual has sinned against God. They mourn their sin and they repent of it. They confess their sins to God and ask him for forgiveness. It's heartfelt confession to God. Heartfelt confession to God is the mark of true mourning. So what is this mourning? That's our first question in Matthew 5, 4. It is, it's acknowledging the true nature of sin. It's mourning over sin, and it's repenting of sin. This is how we initially enter into the kingdom of heaven and how we continue to go on in the kingdom of heaven. You see, it's how we initially enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be part of God's family, then you need to first and foremost mourn over your sin. You need to realize that your sin is not a mere mistake that can be swept under the carpet and ignored. Rather, it's a monstrous crime committed against God. It is the cause of Jesus' death. You see, as I said earlier, your sin, our sin, all sin, nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. Our sin stuck the spear into his side. Our sin took the final breath from our Savior. And if you don't follow Jesus, you need to come and understand this reality and you need to grieve over your sin. You need to be cut to the heart of the, about the ugliness of your sin, that it, that it, that it slights God, that it, that, that, that it spits in the face of the Almighty. This is how we enter the kingdom of God. So this evening, if you're not a Christian, if you're not following Jesus, then you need to see your spiritual bankruptcy. You need to see the sinfulness of your sin. And to do this, if you don't do this, you need to ask God to show you because God is the only one who can, who can convince you of your true identity. Only he can show you your sin. But this mourning over sin is also a distinguishing mark of the one who is already in the kingdom. As I said earlier, that word mourn, uh, that Jesus uses it in a continuous form. So we could say, blessed are those who are continually mourning. And let me ask the Christians, therefore, this evening, Christian, when was the last time you mourned over your sin? When was the last time you were grieved over your sin? No mourning over sin within the Christian is a sign that they've become, uh, have become comfortable with sin and accustomed to it. So what is this morning? It's acknowledging the true nature of sin. It's grieving over it and it's repenting of it. But the second question, and it will be quicker with this one, how does God comfort the mournful? How does God comfort the mournful? Look at the second beatitude. It says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be 
comforted. This man, this, this, this woman is happy and blessed, not simply because they mourn their sinfulness, but because they experience comfort in their mourning. This is one of the motives why we are to mourn our sinfulness this evening. It's because we experience God like we never experience Him, uh, 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 have never experienced Him before. God brings Him, brings a comfort in our mourning. The word comfort here is also used in John's gospel as a title for the Holy Spirit. He is the comforter or the helper, as some translations have it. So it's the Holy Spirit's ministry to comfort people. It's the the Holy Spirit's ministry to convict people of their sin and also to comfort people in their mourning over sin. But how does he comfort? How does he comfort? Well, I think he comforts us by pointing us to Jesus Christ. He comforts us in our sin by first showing us the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. If you turn your Bibles again to Romans 7 for a moment. Romans 7 for a moment. Romans 7 verse 21. Here Paul is speaking as a Christian, and in verse 21 he says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Here Paul is writing as a believer and he's wrestling with the reality that although he's right before God, although he has a a right standing with God, he still sins, he still messes up. Sin still raises its ugly head in his life. And as he considers this reality, he's grieved by his sin. Look at verse 24. He, 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 in a sense, he bursts out and cries out and he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And as he's mourning his sinfulness, as he's grieving his sinfulness, what's his response? Well, verse 25 tells us, what's the source of comfort in this mourning? It's Christ. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul is comforted by the reality that although he's a wretched sinner, Jesus Christ is a wonderful Savior who cleanses him from all sin. And Car Baptist this evening, I want you to know this that we have a wonderful Savior who cleanses us from sin. He doesn't cleanse us from certain sins. Rather, according to 1 John 1, 7, He cleanses us from all sins. He cleanses us from the small sins that we perceive and also the big sins. Your idolatry, your lust, your gossip, your lies, your anger, your laziness, your impurity, your envy, your ingratitude. He cleanses us, uh, us from it all. The reason why the one who mourns is blessed is because they are comforted by the one who is willing to forgive their sin and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Although they mourn sin, they come to know the joy of sins forgiven. And if you're not a Christian this evening, but God is working in your heart and showing you the ugliness of your sin, then let me point you to Jesus Christ. Yes, your sins are many. Yes, your, 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 your background's messy. Yes, there, there's a multitude of wrongs that you have committed in your life. Yes, your sin abounds continually. But Jesus Christ has more grace. He's willing to cleanse you from all sins. He's willing to transform your life completely. So if you're not a Christian this evening and you're mourning your sinfulness, if you're you're mourning the fact that you're a failure in life, that you're a mess up and you don't know what to do with that, well, let me point you to Jesus Christ because he is willing to forgive you from all your sins and change you. He is willing to comfort you. 
The Holy Spirit shows us, comforts us by showing us the crucified and resurrected Christ. But I think also the Holy Spirit comforts us by showing us the coming Christ, by showing us the coming Christ. I want you to imagine in your minds as we begin to close our service this evening, I want you to imagine in your mind a ferocious war. No one is exempt, rather men, women, and children all alike are being affected by the atrocities being committed in this war. Soldiers and civilians alike are being slaughtered There's no end in sight. In fact, there is no guarantee that this war will end. Yet there is a small group of people who have comfort in this war. In this chaos, there's a small group of people who have comfort. It's the Christians. They have comfort that that when they, they don't know that, they don't know that, in fact, when the war will end, but they know eventually it will end at some point. They, they know it will end because their king is one day going to return. You see, in this world full of sin, in this world full of suffering, uh, suffering the effects of sin, the Christian is the only one who can have comfort. Yes, we mourn the sin within us. Yes, we mourn the sin in our society and the effects of sin all around us. But we have comfort that one day, Jesus Christ will return in all his glory and make all things new. When we mourn sin in this world, the Holy Spirit points the Christian to the coming Christ. He points us to the coming Christ to remind us that one day Jesus is coming again to bring an end to all injustice, all suffering, all death, all sin, and will usher in a whole new world. And this evening, if you're a believer, this should comfort you. Not only, not only does it comfort us now, but when he does return, we will experience a comfort like we have never known before. And as we close, I want you to turn one last time in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. very familiar passage, but it's a great passage, a, a passage that reminds us of a day that is coming when all things are going to be made new. Revelation 21 verse 1 says this, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. And I heard a loud loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be be with them as their God. Now notice this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. This passage is telling us that a day is coming when God's blessed mourners will experience a comfort that we have never known before. A day is coming when our mourning over sin will be no more because sin itself will be no more. A day is coming when all things will be made new by Jesus Christ. And this is why in the second beatitude he says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Because he provides comfort in this life and also in in the life to come. Therefore, as I close, are you one who mourns your sin? Do you know what it means to mourn and grieve over your sin? Have you experienced the comfort that Jesus Christ provides? Amen. Let me pray and then we'll sing our closing hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening again just for your wonderful word. We thank you, Lord, that you tell us that the happy, the truly fulfilled in this life are those who don't celebrate their sin, who don't just ignore their sin, but are those who, who, who confess their sin, who grieve over it and repent of it. And we pray, Lord, this evening that you will help us all, non-Christian and Christian alike, 
just to mourn our sin and to repent of it. We thank you that we've been reminded this evening that our Savior is one who abounds and overflows with grace, that he is willing to cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. And we pray this evening, Lord, that we will know the joy and comfort of sins forgiven. Be with us now as we, we part and as we head home into our own home. Be with us and keep us strong in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As I said, we're going to stand and sing, It is well with my soul.
Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.